is 2 p.m. London time. And here we go. On the 17th of September, I welcome you all to this webinar being put together by the Extractive Hubs and Amy, also in conjunction with the Center for Energy Law, Petroleum and Mineral Policy at the University of Dundee. Just by way of a brief introduction, my name is David Amakiri and I'm an energy lawyer from Nigeria, um, working with some of the energy industry participants out of Nigeria's oil and gas industry. And I believe the issues raised in this um, webinar, whose title I'll, I'll tell you shortly, is, is relevant for both um, resource-rich countries and um, countries who are not as resource-rich as African countries, but who are looking to transfer um, technology from um, countries with far more developed um, energy markets and transferring those technology to African markets and Latin America. And so today the topic is the continued role of fossil fuel in the energy transition era. What are the barriers, the key considerations for governments and oil companies? And we'll be looking at it from uh, four broad dimensions. The role that the fossil, fossil fuel um, will play in the energy transition, what are the legal implications? If we are moving um, from hydrocarbons to electrons, what legal issues should agitate the minds of industry participants and um, regulators? And also we'll be looking at the economic implications because for, for many resource rich countries, um, fossil fuel is the, is, is the basis for uh, um, fiscal, fiscal activity within their economies. And so what would be the implication of um, that, that movement away from uh, um, fossil fuel, if you like, away from resor um, resources that could be gotten from fossil exploitation? And also we'll be looking at um, the actions, what, what kind of legislative actions will we see regulators take in this new era? And so just to jump in quickly, we have um, three speakers today. Um, the first would be Dr. Xia Mu, who we always call Sean Mu. Um, Dr. Mu is an energy economist at the CEPMLP. And um, after him, we'll have Dr. Victoria Nalule, who is a researcher with the Extractive Hubs and also the Executive Director of Africa Extractive Management Initiative. And then um, finally, we have, we, we have the pleasure of having the Director of uh, Mines and Petroleum out in, in um, Ethiopia. So he'll be speaking to us directly from Addis Ababa, from the heart of uh, governmental activity in, in uh, North Africa. Uh, and we know, we know the key role that um, Ethiopia plays because if you look at what is happening, you know, the geopolitical dispute with Egypt along the Nile, I mean, these are some of the issues that I, I know will agitate some of the audience and how this can play into the narrative of the energy transition. So without saying too much, um, Dr. Mu will be very happy to hear from you. Uh, Dr. Mu, can you hear me? Sorry, I forgot to unmute my microphone. It's always okay. an issue, right? Yeah, okay. Let me share my slides. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you, David, for that introduction. 
And uh, can you see my slides now? Yes, your slides are very visible. Uh, is it? I think I'm not. I have not turn it on to the slide show. Yeah. Okay, that's probably better, right? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me. Sorry. Okay. So uh, the topic is about the role of fossil fuels in energy transition. Uh, I will plan to talk about three points. Uh, the first will start with some knowns and unknowns of the energy transition. There I will start with the BP uh, energy outlook that just released two days ago, uh, but I'm not going to comment all because you have perfect resource to uh, access them. Uh, the second, I will briefly touch upon on the challenges of the renewables because the energy transition is about uh, the transitioning from the low high carbon to low carbon. So the low carbon is predominantly is about the renewables, wind and solar, but there are still some challenges. That's, uh, whether you know if we want to make any sense of how soon uh, the uh, the transition can happen, that's something we need to understand. Then finally, I will uh, try to give a little bit of my own perspective view on the oil price trend and cycles based on, on my own research. Uh, so those are the three uh, basic points I will probably touch upon. Okay, uh, let's start with the, some highlights from the BP week because I, this I think is just ended yesterday. Uh, the BP this year's outlook, if some of you have uh, followed the BP outlook, uh, is uh, uh, you will notice there is a notable change uh, from last year's outlook. Uh, so here on the left, and I put here is the primary energy consumption by source. Uh, in other words, the primary energy mix uh, by in 2018, that's the current, and then the 2050. Uh, let me see if I can do a little bit clear. Oh, sorry. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, the 2018 is the current, as you can see here, is the pre, uh, is predominated by the fossil fuels, coal, gas, and oil, right? And by 2050, uh, the BP has three scenarios, uh, the rapid net zero and business as usual. The business as usual is pretty much as you know, assume uh, the, there is no dramatic policy uh, actions in the next few years. Uh, so the, uh, it's, it takes into account all the policies that's already real policy, not just uh, announcement. Uh, so in the business as you were on the uh, right bar here, on the very right bar here, uh, you see uh, still the uh, fossil fuel is still dominate is probably something around 70% by 2050. Uh, coal is reducing uh, in absolute values and in relative terms. Gas is expanding. Oil is slightly decreased, but not too much. Uh, then there is a big increase in jump in renewables, in hydro, uh, and to some extent in the nuclear as well. The more dramatic difference is in the rapid scenario and the net zero. The rapid scenario is uh, basically is to uh, assumes the policies can uh, assumes all the policies announced and then the world can meet the 1.5 degree C below the pre-industrial level uh, that is uh, regulated according to the Paris Accord, Paris Agreement. Uh, that's uh, the most dramatic one uh, in last year, the scenario. And then the, uh, the second scenario here is the net zero in the middle. The net zero, uh, this one, uh, 
uh, is uh, more dramatic is announced uh, basically is announced last year the UK Parliament uh, has passed into as a sort of a declaration. Uh, you may also notice the European Union has a uh, carbon neutral uh, basically the more or less the same thing uh, from my understanding is by 2050 uh, the world will move to a net zero carbon emissions uh, so you could still have some carbon emissions in some sectors uh, but there are all got to be some offset so in these two scenarios you can see there is huge increase in renewables basically the renewables here they means only solar and the wind and the hydros the coal is diminishing in rapid as the net zero. And uh, uh, gas is slightly expanding in the rapid scenario, uh, but it's also diminishing in the uh, net zero scenario. And the oil is de reduced in rapid and further reduced, all, um, you can see almost uh, diminishing in the net zero scenario. It's, uh, uh, the net zero is much more difficult to achieve, and uh, you wish, uh, the, what the, their assumption is you will need more than just the policy changes, you will need society, so, uh, social society changes, behavioral changes, and there are technological uh, breakthroughs required. Uh, so in, uh, in another shell here is, uh, so from BP's this year's statistical out, uh, the BP's uh, energy outlook is uh, to some extent, I think is quite a bleak uh, picture for the uh, fossil fuels, particularly in the rapid and net zero scenarios. Uh, they spend a lot of time uh, time talk about uh, the rapid scenario. Uh, so and the, their strategy is probably pivotal to the rapid scenario. Uh, but nonetheless, the net zero is there. Uh, so I will start here. Uh, I'm this, you know, uh, I'm not going to say I uh, sort of agree with them. Uh, actually, I'm quite skeptical with some of this analysis. One thing is in the net zero and the rapid scenario, they assumes like the CCUS will become commercially available. If the CCUS becomes commercially available, then uh, I would imagine coal you will still need it. You will still need coal, particularly for countries like China and India. Uh, the same thing for oil and the gas. Uh, so what is the, what are the implications from this analysis for these scenarios? So look at the uh, on the top right here, the slides, the, uh, for the implications for the liquid fuels, basically is oil. Uh, it's in the business as usual, you can see the oil is better. So this is the green line uh, is probably slightly increase or peak or peak soon in 20, around 2025 20, or 2030. In the rapid scenario, it declines and in the uh, net zero, it declines much, much quicker. And it, by the 2050 is only the world only needs about 25 million barrels per day or oil, which is almost a quarter of today's uh, consumption. Let me say, qualify today that it is not in the pandemic, uh, before the pandemic. Okay. For gas, uh, in the business as usual is in, uh, still increasing. Uh, in the rapid scenario, is uh, increasing and then level off decrease slightly by 2050. Uh, but in the net zero, it declines, also declines quite dramatically. So uh, again, is the this uh, if uh, you follow this, uh, what BP says, uh, it's kind of is quite a bleak picture for the fossil fuels, uh, particularly in these scenarios. I believe they have different scenarios, uh, but these two scenarios because this. This year, they spend quite a lot of time talk about the rapid scenario. Uh, so uh, why I said uh, I didn't necessarily agree with them, 
uh, because there are a lot of uncertainties about these scenarios, uh, because the, the uh, emphasize those scenarios analysis is not a focus, not a prediction, because nobody really can predict the future. Uh, but this gives you some sort of the range or outcome could happen. So in this rapid and net zero scenario, a big assumption is the carbon tax. Right. So the carbon tax you can see in the uh, on the bottom to the two bottom lines, the dotted lines are the business as usual. Uh, so the business as usual in that case is probably some sort of linear increase. Uh, just to give you uh, where we start, the starting point uh, is uh, for the carbon tax in the developing countries is probably there are almost none, it's almost zero. Even in the EU ETS is around like $25 per ton of CO2. Uh, so uh, what the uh, put here is in the business as usual is the carbon tax will increase, uh, but increase more gradually, uh, so by 2050 is, uh, uh, so by 2040 is $50 per 10 is uh, for the developed countries, uh, by 2050, uh, something around $70 per 10. In the rapid and net zero scenarios, there is a huge jump. Uh, so there, for by 2050, even in the developed countries, it assumes the carbon tax will be $250 per 10. Uh, that's uh, like a 10 fold increase. So, uh, you know, uh, this is a huge job and it requires a huge determination to actually to achieve this sort of policy. Uh, so that's why I think this is a huge, a big uncertainty. Uh, so uh, it requires dramatic policy push in the rapid scenarios and in the behavior, in the net zero scenarios, you need more than just a policy push and technological breakthroughs like the CCUS and like the hydrogens uh, and then the behavioral change. So people are more conscious and to, uh, to, uh, conserve, to conserve energy and more sort of uh, energy, using energy efficiently. So uh, there is a, there are a lot of uncertainties. So I'm uh, so that's why uh, you know I started there. I'm not saying you know this is the course things that I think we should all take as uh, uh, as granted. Uh, my personal view on this is to say uh, you know the demand. You know I'm an economist. The demand always responds to prices. One we on oil is, uh, you know, the oil demand, we just look at the oil demand in the United States because the US is still uh, the number one oil consumer in the world. So uh, look at the US uh, oil consumption. So it's increased and the, it's probably uh, some sort of peak in 20, around 2004. And then when oil price went uh, uh, spiked, around the 2007, 2008, it declines. But when after the oil price collapsed in 2012, uh, and then the subsequent years, you see the oil consumption demand has increased. And before the pandemic, uh, before, uh, so it will, we see the oil uh, consumption is probably almost come back to the 2004, 2005 level. So that's uh, one thing I would say cast doubt on the rapid and the uh, net zero scenario, because so the net zero and the rapid scenario is you know, sort of very bleak picture for the fossil fuels. Okay. Uh, let alone the emerging countries, the emerging countries, uh, so uh, many developing countries, one is we still need a lot to, uh, many people don't have cars, uh, so several billion uh, population don't have cars, and then the world's leg, uh, so the uh, 
access to electricity is still quite limited. I have seen some statistics, some statistics one, in, uh, one, one out of seven people in the planet still don't have access to electricity. Uh, so let me quickly summarize this news and I know many of these you probably know. Uh, so uh, the first note is we know the world is transitioning to low carbon uh, energy systems, but we don't know how fast is this transition going to be. Uh, so that's why you need different scenarios, uh, whether you agree or not, it gives you some sort of, as long as you know these assumptions, you give the uh, a range of outcomes could be. Uh, we know there are a lot of policy pledges, announcements, particularly in Europe, in EU, in UK, the carbon neutral or net zero, uh, but we don't really know how much of these pledges will be followed through. Uh, so to what extent they are just announcement or to what extent they will be uh, legally binding. Companies, some companies are doing something to try to uh, adjust, like the European IOCs, BP, Shell, Total, uh, has sort of tried to reposition themselves. Uh, BP is the new uh, brand, is sort of integrated energy company, not from international oil company to integrated energy companies. Uh, so that's what they try to do uh, to rebrand. Uh, to, we don't know to what extent they are organic changes, meaning is they really want to do this or more so do as a risk hygiene and whether they are will be successful or not. Uh, so uh, from, poly, from government policy and uh, from companies, uh, the other player is the public, is our consumers, you and me. We know there are extinction rebellions. So those are the nice pictures. Uh, but we don't really know how much consumers are willing to pay for the extra cost and to what, to what extent they will change behavior. You know, whether you want to, you will uh, forget about driving and you want to take some more shared drive, uh, so shared uh, mobilities share. So that's all. There are, uh, you know, to what, what extent those consumer behavior will change, but there will be some changes. So uh, that's uh, the first point. I think I've probably used it quite a lot of time. I will quickly touch upon these challenges for renewables. Uh, here I will touch basically from two points. One is uh, because uh, the uh, energy transition is tra uh, transitioning from uh, high carbon to low carbon, one important thing is we will see a lot of new, uh, a bigger role in electricity. So uh, whether it's the you can see the electrons. So the electricity is where the renewables can play a bigger role because you know you can use elect uh, wind and solar to generate electricity. Uh, so we know the uh, the renewables one uh, inherent problem with the renewables is the intermittency problems with wind and solar. Uh, the intermittency problems will need more than batteries. There are a lot of uh, drive for the batteries, uh, but uh, you know you will need a huge, uh, so you will still need some sort of uh, fossil fuel or a pump storage hydro to back up them. That's increase the system cost. A lot of people talk about the cost of the renewables has decreased, the levelized cost for or energy has decreased, uh, but you, if you only talk about the levelized cost, it could be misleading because for every megawatt of uh, wind or solar you build up, you will need more backup power as well. One thing, you know, uh, actually I'm currently still in California. Uh, so you may notice uh, California recently, in as soon as recent as in August. Uh, so the California still, uh, because the California uh, has to uh, has some sort of road black, uh, blackout or brownout in uh, August when the uh, heat wave uh, hit California. So that's uh, the you know that's the most advanced economy. We still have this problem. One issue with this is obviously is because a lot of solar installed. 
uh, the, the famous dark curve in California. Uh, so uh, limited by time, I'm not going to go into it. Uh, the uh, renewables for electricity for EVs. Uh, so uh, one big issue for the mobility is so we uh, uh, is going is assumes that we uh, the world will be uh, more electric vehicles uh, will come into the fleet. Uh, so there are still challenges. We see uh, there is huge increase. Is this increase probably? Uh, the annual sales of the cars, the recent annual sales of the cars, the EV electro, uh, electrical vehicles is probably like 2% of the annual sales. Uh, but there are still key technological barriers need to break through. One is the uh, convenience of driving, particularly in terms of driving range, which requires a lot of breakthrough in battery, uh, and then the charging time. Uh, those are, you know, the battery cost has declined, but I think is uh, uh, there will be some sort of limit on that. And then finally, the electricity need to have low carbon content than the petroleum to make this transition worthwhile. Otherwise, you, if you like in China, you replace uh, the low uh, the uh, internal. Uh, combustion engines with the see, electric vehicles, but the electricity, 70% of electricity is generated by coal, does not make much sense in terms of carbon emissions, right? Uh, finally, uh, I give a little bit my own view on the oil price, because this is something that I have done some research. Uh, first of all, the thing is the oil price is always difficult to predict, to forecast, uh, or the forecast will be wrong. Uh, but you could give some range. This is based on, on one of my published paper uh, about the cycles and trend models. So in this model, basically, is you look at the historical data and to look and try to uh, sort of uh, assume the history, what you learn from history will give us some insight for the future. Uh, so you see the oil price is going to be Sure, lower for longer for some time, quite some time. Uh, there is a wide range, uh, uh, but it could eventually go up uh, at some point. Uh, but uh, it would be difficult to go back to $100 anytime soon. Uh, the last point I'm coming back to the oil, uh, the BP. Uh, outlook uh, because it tells something about the investment if uh, countries are interested in this. Uh, so in all these scenarios, you probably still need some investment because what they show here is this on the top is the, uh, say the part, this is for the oil, the left panel. The oil, these different scenarios, uh, these are the uh, oil demand for sort of scenarios, but the, the uh, black, dotted line is basically is the, uh, if there are no investments, the natural decline, what will implies? So what are the oil production? What are the uh, oil supply? So the implication is uh, unless there is, uh, unless for this net zero, so even in the net zero cases, you will still need some sort of investment uh, to uh, get uh, the oil uh, supply demand balanced uh, by UN by 2030, okay. uh, the more so for gas. Uh, let me just quickly summarize, so I think I used too much time. Uh, so the energy transition is determined by technology by and economics, but influenced by policy, particularly about the carbon tax. There are huge uncertainties. Uh, the oil price, I think lower for longer will last for at least for some time. And uh, finally, don't fire sell your oil and gas assets. You will still need to buy oil, oil and sell assets. Okay, uh, with that, I will stop here, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, probably now I'll turn back to David or Victoria, uh, just to continue. Okay, thank, thank you very much, um, Dr. Shamu, uh, for that precise presentation. Um, <clears throat> we, we expect that there'll be questions for you and we know that the participants will 
drop their questions in the question and answer section and we'll take them at the end of the presentations. So we we'll just quickly go into Dr. Victoria Nadele's presentation. Uh, thank you very much, David, for the introduction. And thank you very much, Sean Moore, for the brilliant presentation. So I'll use 10 minutes so that Bamla can also give us insights from Ethiopia because he's the policymaker. So he'll definitely tell us what's on the ground. Uh, so basically, uh, I'll look at the role of fossil fuels in the energy transition era, specifically looking at the barriers and strategies for developing countries, including those in Africa. As I was introduced, I'm a research fellow at the Extractive Hub based at the Center for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral and Policy. And I'm also an author of energy and mining books, including four books so far, and one edited one, which is also will be coming up. So my research is focused on energy and mining and various other issues, specifically in Africa. So just to start the discussion, because uh, Sean more clearly outlined what is happening right now. So I'll not take or waste a lot of time on the issue of energy transitions, but I'd like to highlight the main drivers of the energy transition. First and foremost, uh, the need to tackle climate change as stipulated in the 2015 Paris Agreement. It has encouraged or forced many countries to embrace renewable energy as a way of not only tackling climate change, but also achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goal 7, which focuses on access to affordable and clean energy. But I note in Sub-Saharan Africa, over 600 million people have no access to electricity. And according to data from the International Energy Agency, it's estimated that this number of people, the 600 million people who have no access to electricity, the number is likely to increase. And on top of that, we notice, as Sean mentioned, that um, uh, according to the BP statistics, uh, population growth is estimated to increase and also urbanization will be taking place in lots of African countries. Now we notice like the main drivers to, for energy transition is to tackle climate change and also to address energy access. However, another driver as to why people are embracing uh, energy transitions is the fact that uh, fossil fuels are exhaustible. So at the end of it, you will know that these are exhaustible resources and they're not renewable. So that's also another driver. And um, I'll discuss this issue of a resource cars later on in my discussion when um, addressing the reason as to why more African countries really need to focus on both fossil fuels and renewable energy for their economic development. Now, um, I'll not go so much into detail about this, like, but this graph, it's also BP statistics, but it's a bit old since there's a new one. Uh, uh, and in this graph, you'll see that uh, the fossil fuel sector will still play a major role in industry, in transport, and also buildings. But the most important thing I want to note here are the current developments in different countries. In, in spite of the global move to transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, in Mozambique, uh, I think I forgot to mention that Sub-Saharan Africa is a home to massive energy resources, including fossil fuels, uh, oil and gas. Uh, for instance, in Mozambique, the country holds 100 trillion cubic feet of proved natural gas reserves. And now um, recently we've seen developments in the fossil fuel sector despite of the global move to transition to a low carbon economy. For instance, on 30th June 2020, we saw president, the president of Nigeria launching a $2.6 billion, a $2 billion gas project. And this is a very long project, which is six, 614 kilometer long. And in Uganda, just this month, we saw two major developments we saw the president of Uganda and the president of Tanzania signing an agreement for the construction of uh, an East African gas pipeline, an East African crude oil pipeline. And this is estimated to be around uh, $3.5 billion. 
So we are seeing major projects in different countries despite the global move to transition to a low carbon economy. And this basically implies that most African countries, although they're embracing renewable energy, they still want to benefit from their fossil fuel projects. And this is the main, uh, this, uh, the main issue for me to discuss what are the barriers to fossil fuel development in these countries in this energy transition era, because like I've, not, I've mentioned, we are seeing investments coming in in these projects, but then what are the key issues for policymakers with respect to development of their fossil fuels? So this is what is happening in some of these sub-Saharan African countries, but then what is happening in the other parts of the world? We are seeing in, in the EU, they announced their 2030 climate and energy framework, which aims to achieve 40% reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And now the most, um, most important thing of it, or I I'll say the main barrier, which is presented by the developments in the other parts of the world, is the decline in finances for fossil fuel projects because uh, besides the targets set by the EU, we also saw in November that the European uh, Investment Bank approved a policy to ban funding for oil, gas, and coal projects at the end of 2021. Uh, however, we note the, the, uh, the need or the reliance on investments in natural gas so even if they're cutting funding in oil and coal projects, we're seeing there is uh, a chance for countries to still utilize their natural gas resources. And recently in June 2020, we also saw the Norwegian parliament recommending that the sovereign wealth fund sells off uh, more than $10 billion of stock in companies related to fossil fuels so in this respect, it means that the World Fund can no longer invest in companies that mine more than 20 million tons of coal annually or generate more than 10,000 um, 10, MW of power using coal. So this is also a major development in the other parts of the world. We're seeing that financial institutions and other key institutions reducing or deducting funding for fossil fuel projects. And now this is the main barrier because I've already taken you through the, some of the developments in some African countries who are still investing in fossil fuels. But now we're seeing that some of the main barrier to fossil fuel development in the energy transition era. The first one is the financial risk as illustrated in the examples I've given you from the EU and also from Norway. And the unstable markets, besides fossil fuels being exhaustible, we have also seen volatile oil prices. And these are basically caused by different economic uh, circumstances. And now also the other thing is uh, renewables are becoming more attractive, basically because of the main things I discussed as being the main drivers for, to energy transition renewables because most, most companies, energy companies, they want to show themselves as being uh, climate change conscious. So they're investing more in renewables. And in Kenya, we recently saw um, an investment in the wind energy project, which costed the country $18 million to construct. So these are some of the developments that, going, that are going on in the energy sector generally which directly and indirectly have an impact on fossil fuel developments in African countries. Now, besides these major points, we note the role of the community. We are seeing lots of protests in Kenya, for instance, when we are constructing the Lamo call, the, the call project in Lamo. We are seeing pro protests in German, where uh, local communities are protesting against the construction or development of coal projects. So these are the main barriers to fossil fuel developments in Africa. But however we're not, even if 
I myself, I believe uh, these countries should invest both in renewables, but they should also not give up their fossil fuels. But and but we we have to note that this doesn't mean that these countries are climate change deniers. We have already seen lots of projects, renewable energy and energy efficiency projects, going on at the national and regional level. For instance, in the Southern African Development Community, we saw. Uh, uh, we, we saw like a, a lot of increase in renewable energy projects in 2000, from 2015 to 2018. But however, we note that with the current COVID-19 pandemic, many companies have gone into bankruptcy and as such they're questioning their investment decisions. So this can also be one of the barriers. But, uh, but nevertheless, we are seeing uh, other countries like in China, where they've invested more in, in coal uh, during this uh, current pandemic. So it's a two-way thing. Renewables are becoming more attractive, but also countries are realizing that they still need their fossil fuels. Um, now, that's basically the barriers to fossil fuel development in the energy transition era. So what are the key policy considerations? Uh, myself, uh, I was recently involved in the review of a, a, a bill, petroleum bill for South Africa, for Namibia, and I've also been in touch with different policymakers in other African countries. And the question is, what should they do? Like everyone is asking themselves, what should what should be uh, what should be considered, or what can these countries do to ensure that they can still develop their energy sector? So one thing is to invest more in clean technology to reduce emissions from fossil fuels. And also there's a need for good governance so as to benefit from extractives. In the first, in the first slide, I left out the issue of a resource cars, but I wanted to bring it up here because now we're saying that renewable energy finances from revenues from, from extractives from oil and gas it can be used to transition to a low carbon economy. It can be used to invest in renewable energy projects. However, this will not happen with poor governance because we've seen countries uh, that are very rich in oil and gas resources facing the instances of a resource curse. So in, in this scenario, policymakers should ensure that utilize the revenues from extractive industries to finance renewable energy projects. However, we have also to take into consideration the legal and policy considerations because now most of the laws are a bit outdated. So policymakers should consider amending their laws to take into consideration the current developments with respect to energy transitions and the global move to tackle climate change. So this will just be brief, um, available to take in questions. I'll let Mr. Bamlack have the floor. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Victoria, for this um, very deep overview of what different countries are doing. And um, please watch out. We'll have some questions for you um, after Mr. Bamlack uh, makes his presentation. Mr. Bamlack, if you can hear us, please proceed. Mr. Bamlack, are you, are you still there with us? Oh, I see he's offline. Let me see if he's. Maybe it's network problems. Um, David, I think in the meantime, you can let Sean Moore address his questions as we see if we can still get Mr. Bamlack. He was, he just went offline, I think. It's maybe network problems. Um, okay. Um... Dr. Sean Mu, I, I I wanted you to talk about the the contribution we we expect to see from um, new technology because, like you said, investment in technology will still will, will be one of the key drivers for us to transition into into this uh, net zero scenario. 
So I, I wanted you to look at what, what is the state of play currently in respect of um, carbon capture one, and then in respect of hydrogen? Uh, yes, uh, that's a very good question, David. Uh, so uh, honestly, uh, I will teach a course or model in the autumn semester and will address some of these issues. My short answer is right now, they are not commercially competitive yet. Uh, so for example, the CCUS, there are pilot projects there is one in North Sea, not too far from Dengi. And uh, uh, the, uh, several pro the quite a, a number of projects in North America, in Canada. Uh, so basically is to capture the, uh, the uh, carbon and then to use those carbon for the enhanced oil recovery. Uh, but because of the CCUS, it requires not only the carbon, it requires capture, it requires the transportation of the CO2, and then you need to store it and go and find a place to store it. Uh, so that's the S storage, right? So it's uh, quite expensive and it's not really commercially viable. Uh, that's why uh, in the BP's outlook, they assume many of these technologies will be in the second half of their uh, outlook. So basically from 2035 onward. Uh, so that's uh, the CCUS. Hydrogen, the same thing. Hydrogen, uh, you know, people talk about hydrogen for quite a long time. Uh, so, you know, we use the electronics uh, analysis to, uh, you know, to uh, basically to use water to generate electricity, uh, hydrogen. And then uh, the, uh, the so-called the uh, green hydrogen is uh, basically is to uh, use oil or gas or coal to generate hydrogen. Uh, so the right now the hydrogen is still quite expensive. That's one thing is to generate it, the other is to store it, to transport it, to transport it. Uh, these are all still quite expensive. There are pilot projects. Uh, so the I think. Uh, uh, Leeds in the UK, uh, it has a sort of ambitious uh, plan to uh, run the whole city on hydrogen, so to retrofit natural gas pipelines. I don't know to what extent uh, that can be done. Uh, so uh, that's uh, to retrofit natural gas pipelines and to uh, uh, you, you know, the hydrogen is the good thing for hydrogen is this is uh, storable, but the bad thing is, you know, uh, it's uh, highly, uh, there are uh, uh, fire dangers. Uh, so that's the sort of things, you know, the uh, even your, uh, your appliance, like your uh, cook stove, uh, need to be changed. So, so that's, there are challenges. Uh, technological bar barriers there. So it's, uh, I think that's also in the BP's uh, the, uh, outlook, they assume uh, both CCUS and the hydrogen will be come available probably in the, around after 2035. So another 15 years to develop something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Moon. Um, there's a question from, uh, Abubakar Hassan, and I, and I think this question, I, I'd like both of you to just give your view on, on the question, because he says, um, don't fire your oil and gas assets. That why would you, what he's saying is, why would you advise governments not to sell off their oil and gas assets, considering the fact that the reports we are seeing from available statistics is that um, demand for oil Will, has already peaked and it's it's only driving down, and then prices for of oil will remain low for a long period of time. So, why would you advise government to to keep their oil and gas assets? Uh, I would say it's a, yeah. Uh, so, uh, don't fire sale. You know, don't rush to sell uh, to sell. That's one. Uh, two is, I think the implication here is you should, uh, I mean, if you look at my last slides, which is uh, also from BP, in all these scenarios, particularly in the 
20, before 2030, 2035, there are still, uh, there is still a gap between uh, the uh, supply simply because of the natural decline. Uh, if there were no investment, uh, you know, the gap between demand and supply, right? So you, you will, with, the, with the, all these scenarios, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, for producers, companies need to control their costs. Uh, and then for, co for countries, if you can do anything to help companies to control their costs, whether through tax or some sort of other things, uh, that would be uh, welcome. Uh, so that's uh, my quick two quick points on this. Uh, so the natural decline is real and the UN I notice, uh, so the, uh, there is a reference to the shale oil, shale uh, gas. So the shale oil, shale gas are also, you remember, is uh, declines quite fast. Right? So, uh, so that's uh, the, uh, my quick point on this. Maybe Victoria want to uh, add something? Uh, I think you've said it all. So that's more from an economic perspective. As a lawyer, I don't think I would have a lot to say. But also based on the reports, even if currently the prices are down, and even if currently the demand is down, it doesn't mean that it's going to stay down forever. Because we are seeing statistics that these countries we still need to uh, solve issues of energy security and energy access, and that assures that these challenges are going to escalate. The numbers without access is going to escalate. So what, what would make a, a country think that it's the right time to sell off their fossil fuel projects or, or, or any investments? Because at the end of the day, we still need the fossil fuels. So I think also in my opinion, countries shouldn't rush. They should take their time because they still need the resources. So that will be my brief about that. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. And there's another interesting question. I think Dr. Victoria, you, you, you should look at this question. Um, this person is from Cameroon. And it, the person says, for a country like Cameroon is a small producer of oil and gas. And, and I think for many other countries in Africa as well. So the question is, should, should the energy transition be the same for all countries? No, it can't be the same because uh, I, I think I mentioned in my previous presentations, different countries face different energy challenges. The energy transition, in my opinion, is different for developed countries and for developing countries. There's a geographical perspective of energy transitions. Even in a country like Cameroon, the transition can be the same in rural areas and urban areas. There's that aspect of progression for people in rural areas or for people in developing countries, where you're seeing people in rural areas are just progressing from the use of traditional biomass or traditional energy that includes charcoal, biomass, candles, and then they're progressing into other modern forms of energy. So the transition can be what the same for countries. It cannot be the same for regions. It cannot be the same for areas. We have to respect the aspect of geographical um, geographical implications when we're discussing energy transitions, that's the only way we'll ensure that no country is left behind. So in my opinion, Cameroon should understand the unique challenges they face as a country and address them accordingly. They shouldn't rush or look at what is going on globally, what is going on in developed countries, and then they follow the bandwagon of they have to do the same. They have to appreciate their own challenges and transition at their own rate. However, this doesn't mean that they shouldn't focus on investments in renewable energy, but they should utilize all the energy resources they have to ensure that they tackle the energy challenges they face in the country. Thank you, I think that's um, very explicit. Now there's a question for um, Dr. Shamu. The question says, in your presentation, the rapid and net zero scenarios showed lower levels of gross energy consumption than the business as usual scenario. How realistic is this view in the expectation that the Earth's population and energy use will increase over the coming years? What may lead to these scenarios? Uh, 
That's a good question. Uh, you know, it's uh, BP's outlook. It's not my outlook, right? Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second thing is, you say, uh, even in the rapid and net zero uh, scenarios, uh, they also show there are increases. So they take into account the population growth, and more importantly, is the prosperity. So there are more people will move uh, out of the poverty. Uh, so as we move up uh, to the poverty, you know, you more people would want to, you know, drive or to fly. So that's the sort of things. Uh, now it is lower than the business as zero. I think their assumption is one is there are there will be some sort of behavioral change. For example, like the shared mobility, what they call it. Uh, so the specific example is like this, right? So uh, you know, if you imagine if we are there is a sort of the smart car, smart car or autopilot, right? So you can have a car. You don't really need to have a car, or maybe you have a car, you, you use your autopilot and drive you to the work. And then through, uh, during, when, you know, during the five or uh, four hours in your office, your car can be called by Victoria and then the car to make some money for you. So, I mean, the same person, the same car can have, uh, there will be better utilization of this. So that's the sort of uh, energy efficiency. Now, how realistic is, I don't know. So that's why I say is uh, I'm not endorsing what they say, uh, but there it gives you some sort of possible outcomes. All right, um, thanks. Uh, Dr. Victoria, uh, you know, in your presentation, you discussed um, the various actions being taken by countries. You gave the example in, in Norway, in the EU. And my question would be, what are the big companies doing? Because, I mean, apart from BP, who is now ramping up its rhetoric as far uh, beyond petroleum, I think the other big companies are really betting on uh, fossil fuel infrastructure in Africa. If you look at um, Total, for example, Total is on the deal for the Uganda Tanzania gas pipeline. Um, a company like Marubeni from Japan is also betting big on gas infrastructure in Nigeria. So it, it seems to be that some of the big companies are still betting on these projects. Yes, yes, like I mentioned, because these big companies definitely understand that fossil fuels will still play a major role in these countries in a decade or so to come. So most, com most companies actually, including Total and Shell, besides the investments in fossil fuels, they have also taken up projects in renewable energy. Like in Brazil, I think, uh, uh, was it Shell? It invested a lot in some renewable energy projects. So they're going green, but this doesn't mean in any way that investments in renewable and in, in fossil fuels are declining entirely. But however, some financial institutions, because these are companies, they're not financial institutions. So some financial institutions are shying away from making investments or supporting companies that want to invest in fossil fuels. But I said it's a two-way thing. Whereas some people or uh, some scholars and some experts might think that it's not good or all countries should transition and uh, let's say not entirely leave their fossil fuels but reduce investments in fossil fuels. Myself, in my opinion, I feel like if these countries still need the fossil fuels, then they can invest in both fossil fuels and renewables. And I think it's just my opinion that even these big oil companies still understand the role of fossil fuels in developing countries or even in developed countries. So that's why they're making this kind of investments because if they felt that fossil fuels will be useless in a decade or so, they would not be making those massive investments. So my my advice to policymakers would be to be patient and ensure that they benefit from both fossil fuels and renewables. All right, thank you. Um, there's, there's this question about funding. And 
It's from uh, Adele, and she's saying European financial institutions are pulling out from funding oil and gas assets internationally. But major funding could still come from places like Saudi Arabia, China, and into such um, oil and gas projects. If you, if you also think of um, the, the role of the Qataris, um, the role of the Iranians in funding um, this kind of projects, despite the position of European financiers. So, so she's asking, what, what do you think? I think the other funders are doing the right thing. So I feel, <laughs> I feel it's, it's a hypocritical, it's hypocritical for countries such as those in Europe to utilize these resources for a very long time. And now when it's time for other countries to utilize the resources, they are shying away from investing in these resources. So I think other funders like China and all the other funders who want to invest in fossil fuels, they're doing the right thing. And that's, that's also another reason for countries not to give up hope on fossil fuels. Uh, Dr. Victoria, I like your Afrocentric view, but I, I would like to, I would like to uh, hear from uh, Dr. Shonmu. Uh, 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 yes, uh, I, to a lot of extent, I agree with Victoria, <laughs> you know, what has been said. So you see, uh, my, the, all the, my oral assessment on this is to say Europe in general is more spearheaded on this, uh, on the climate change issues. Uh, you know, European Union, uh, UK, uh, and uh, uh, is UN uh, much more ahead than, you know, than the US, for example. US, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump is obviously is this uh, UNA, I think we have a Biden president is probably going to be quite difficult to be dramatic change. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. Uh, then obviously there is multi, there are other founders funding, uh, funding this. Uh, the other thing uh, relating to this investment issues is uh, to, uh, to be aware is many of these assets are long life assets. So, you know, 20, 40 years. Uh, so like pipelines could be 34, 40 years. So uh, that's, uh, so again, it's the, the sort of, uh, I think you, what we need is a sort of more competitiveness, you know, make your projects more competitive. So that's uh, one otherwise, yeah. Okay, my, my follow up to you, Dr. Shamu, would be that you, you mentioned the US, but um, <clears throat> from my latest observation of things that are happening within the capital market in the US, stocks, the stocks of, um, of oil companies, energy companies in general, are not doing particularly well. And uh, it, this seems to suggest that investors are betting on the transition? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, you know, uh, I have recently looked at this issue. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, or I compared BP, uh, Shell, ExxonMobil, Chevron, uh, all this, actually they are doing equally bad. Uh, why? I think it's the main reason is more uh, is about uh, the oil price crash. Uh, so particularly, you know, since March, uh, you know, so that's the really, that's the main reason for this. Uh, you know, for the, you just look at the IOCs, uh, this, uh, if you look at the X and mobile, uh, they are not how a dramatic, Reimagination of the energy uh, as BP does. Uh, so right or right or wrong is uh, you know is uh, let's see I don't know is uh, but uh, I think the big picture is the transition is happening. Uh, so with a uh, uh, wholesome is 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 a question. Uh, I think it's good for to do something like, you know, uh, to invest in renewables uh, and uh, to as a hedge. Uh, actually, you know, BP is doing this right now more aggressively. They have, they had uh, this uh, BP solar uh, 
20 years ago. Now, it's, I think in the die west uh, in the 20 uh, earlier and in 2018, they buy, uh, they bought uh, another company called the, now Light Source BP. So that's, that's what they, uh, they, are, they are doing. And thank you very much, Dr. Shomu. I mean, very interesting, interesting perspective. Um, unfortunately, we would have liked to take some more questions, but we, we have run out of time. And, uh, and so I, I'd like to say thank you very much to our presenters today. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't hear from um, the, the, the mouthpiece of the government in Ethiopia, really, on how the Ethiopian government is thinking about the energy transition. But we are looking, um, we'll look at the possibility of getting back Mr. Bamla to give us his position. And um, the, you can get more of these webinars on the Extractive Hubs website. And, uh, and I'm sure including this one, the, the recordings will be available for you. Um, so from my end, thank you very much, Dr. Victoria. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Sean Mo. Uh, it's unfortunate, I think, uh, Mr. Bamla got connect, uh, connect internet issues, so we weren't able to hear from him. From him, our participants, I'll send you all the slides and the link to the video. Stay tuned and have a lovely day. Bye bye. Thank you for everyone. Thank you.